Today is July the 5th, 2003. We are making this interview for the Veterans History Project for the Atlanta History Center. Um, we are recording today at Bent Tree, Georgia. We are interviewing Dr. Henry DeWitt Matters, otherwise known as Speedy Matters. He was born on September the 24th, August the 24th, 1912. August. August 24th, 1912. My name is Connie Matters. I'm his daughter. In attendance are his wife, Phoebe Matters, and his other daughter, Susan Matters. We are now going to start with our list of questions um, for the interviewee, Dr. Matters. Dr. Matters, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. When did you enlist? Approximate. Good question. Okay. About uh, 19 and uh, 43. All right. Where were you living when you enlisted? At uh, Grady Hospital in Atlanta. Living at Grady. Why did you join? I joined the service because it felt my duty to join. Uh, why did you pick the Navy to enlist? That's a good story. At Grady, they had a Navy. I had an Army man come down and interview each of us individually. And his attitude was, if we don't sign up, they will draft us. So we didn't like his attitude, so we called the Navy office and asked them if they could send somebody down. They sent a lieutenant down, and the lieutenant said, Yep, we have papers that you can stay here three months on your residency and then join, which all of us joined except one. One boy told the Army man he wasn't going because he was 4L. He had lost a leg from a snake bike when he was a teenager, and he was 4L. And he said, well, we'll get you. If you can work here, you can work there. And he was inducted first. Went through training and was going aboard ship in, in, uh, on the West Coast. And some officer saw him and said, get him out of line. <laughs> then they sent him to uh, the hospital in Washington. That's where he interned. Okay. At Grady Hospital in Atlanta, tell us about your residency, uh, your medical training. What were you in residency for? Well, I went to went to uh, med school at Augusta at the University of Georgia Medical School, and I interned my first year in Baltimore City Hospitals. And while I was at Baltimore Hospitals, that's when Pearl Harbor was bombed, December the seventh. Then I came to Grady to continue my education and residency. At that time, the uh, medical schools had increased. Instead of nine months, they went 12 months. And all of the students were drafted, and they were actually in uniform. Yeah. And uh, it, it depleted the house staff, so they let a few of us finish so we could thing going at Grady and we spent three months on our residency and that's when I was went into the service. Were you in a specialty at that time? OBGYN. OBGYN and this was in the early 40s, late 30s, early 40s? Well it was yeah in mid 40s. 43. Okay. No further than that. 45, 46. Okay. All right. Um, Let's move ahead after you were drafted. Do you recall your first days in service and what it felt like? Well, I was sent to Corpus Christi, Texas. Four hours reported at the same date. And we were assigned to part of the hospital. The captain told us, 
he liked for her Navy doctors to be do, do a little of everything. And I was put on a war with hemorrhoids and pyelonidosis. <laughs> After four weeks, the first boy out of our four was sent out to some, some other place. And the next week, the second one was sent out. And the third week, the third one was sent, so I figured I was ready to go. But I stayed on for about two or three weeks longer because they moved me over to the wave ward. And I figured, well, <laughs> I got it made now. But when I got to the wave ward, I found out that the, loot, that the lieutenant commander in charge was the pathologist, and he didn't have time to work on the charts. And they were all in a mess, so I just worked them up. And uh, after, after about two weeks of doing that, the, the phone rang and the nurse said, the captain wants to talk to you. And I answered the phone. He says, our urologist was sent to sea duty and we're sending you over to take urology. And, okay. <laughs> well, I stayed over there about two or three weeks and then I was sent out. You were sent out. You had the word drill written down by this. Huh? You had the word drill written down by Well, this. that's not... That's that's not that yet. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. While I was at while I was at Paris Island, I mean at uh, uh, Texas Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi. I had ROTC in college, so they had me drilling the doctors. <laughs> that was good. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to pass inspection, did you? Mm -hmm. No, you were doctors. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're moving to segment three, your experiences, which is really why we're here. What? Uh, this was World War II. Where exactly were you sent when you were sent out? Well, after I left Corpus Christi, I was sent to uh, California. Uh, what was that? San Diego. Um, I, it'll come to me tonight. <laughs> yeah. To the beach there? where the APAs or the Higgins boats were training. Oh, really? And I went aboard the uh, ship there. Okay. You remember arriving? What was it like? Was it the first time you'd ever seen a big ship? <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> just about it. <laughs> but they were training, hitting the beach and loading and unloading. The Higgins ships? The Higgins boats from our boat. And I would ride in with them and come back. Sometimes, you know, they'd, <laughs> it, they didn't hardly get back. But anyway, that was this. I was uh, assigned to a uh, 500 doctors who were at... Uh, Oh, what's the, Cali what's the marine base in California? Anyway, no. we had one week's training, which usually took five weeks. Oh, wow. And on Saturday, they took us over and let shoot carbines. And when we got, the, the old Navy men said, when you get aboard ship, they'll give you a 45. Well, what did we shoot these for? He says, I don't know. <laughs> That's how mixed up things were. What was your assignment? I was the fifth doctor aboard ship. What kind of ship? APA. What's that stand for? Attack Transport. Okay. Who had Higgins boats. And uh, the, do the, uh, the, 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 the other doctor, he went ashore with the beach party oh, really? with an invasion and set up, set up the... Uh, you know, a health center, so yeah. help uh, uh, set up an uh, emergency area to take care of the wounded. And if something happened to him, then I was supposed to go. So I was the fifth doctor. But there were four doctors on the ship. Yeah. How many men were on the ship? Do you remember? How many what? How many men were on the ship? Just I don't remember. Thousand. Depends on how many, how many train, 
how many troops we carried, okay. see. I didn't know if they did it by the number of people as to the number of doctors you got. No. What kind, was everybody just a general practice doctor, just? Well, some of them were surgeons and some of them were this, yeah. They didn't need an OB on that ship, did they? No. <laughs> just curious. Okay, so you were the fifth doctor. Um, did you see combat? I saw combat on two or three islands, but the main thing I saw combat at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. <coughs> And on in the convoy going to Iwo Jima, the night before the invasion, it was one of those rainy, dusty, foggy afternoons. About dark, our ship had a problem. The lights went off, the motors stopped, and we sat in the ocean. The convoy waved at us as they went by. <laughs> but they weren't going to stop, naturally. So we sat there for about eight or ten hours, dead in the water. <laughs> All these reports of submarines around and all. Well, we said, well, we're here. We can't have to do anything about it. Anyway, they got the thing started. And we got into the battle about 10 or 11 o'clock the next morning. Was it still going on? Oh, it just started at daylight, started. yeah. Wow. So you saw it from the ship. Was your ship firing on? Oh, yeah, you know, okay. firing on. Moved in and dropped our troops so they could get the beach. And were they coming back wounded? Yeah. The ship? But fortunately, they had a hospital ship and they took care of most of them. Now, when we went into the last invasion, Okinawa, mm -hmm. that was the area where the Kamikaze ships flew over the island. And fortunately, the Navy had stationed uh, uh, ships on the other side of the island, and they would shoot those things down before they got to us, fortunately. But uh, our ship was designated the uh, prisoner of war ship. We had one prisoner. <laughs> one. They didn't take prisoners back then, either side. Really? And, uh, and speaking of that, uh, they tell the story about the flyboys from down in Esperito Santo. They would pick up a lot of the prisoners, Japanese prisoners, and fly them back. And as they would fly them back, they would in t try to get information from them. If they wouldn't get it, they'd just open the door and throw one out. No. And by the time they got back down there, they were talking right and left. See? <laughs> and that actually happened. Because yeah. neither side wanted to take any prisoners. The you Japanese didn't, they didn't. You had one. We had one. <laughs> we kept him about a day, and I, they took him somewhere. I don't know where they took him. He was one of those kamikaze flyers that uh, survived. survived. <laughs> but they didn't intend to survive. They were going to hit something. Our ship, fortunately, didn't get hit too bad. But but you could you could you could tell the feel the dawn the bombs that missed it because it would raise it out of the water when it hit. Were you actually working on somebody, like operating or helping, you know, a wounded person when you got hit? Could you feel it? Were you worried well, about you could, power? Or? You could feel it because it would say, yeah. Well, we did that on, oh. on the Okinawa one. And, and it, we didn't have a lot of, a whole lot of bad cases. Most of them weren't too bad. So did you have people die on your ship that you tried to save, Americans? Not there, but we had, we had, uh, <laughs> we were somewhere between islands. And one morning this boy was missing in at duty, officer. <laughs> Nobody could find him. They figured he jumped overboard or somebody pushed him up. But we buried him at sea. Never found him, though. Never found him. Interesting. 
No, we didn't bury them because we didn't have any. I was going to say, how could you bury them? You just had I know, we, we had one, one uh, boy we had to bury at sea, yeah. That's well, I asked if there were, were there casualties on your ship? Not many, Good. fortunately, because our, our ship was a transport ship who took the troops and took them to the beach and turned them back. Now, some of the boys in the riding those Higgin boats didn't get back. But uh, that's the way to, we were we were traveling inter island inter island and we were getting ready for a landing and the captain got orders to move this dental outfit from one station to the next who had nurses and he says I won't take them I don't want the women on my ship <laughs> stopping up my plumbing. No. That's right. He said that. And he wouldn't take them. Go ahead. A lot of the boys who, who were on our ship who went into the Higgins boats and helped with the landings, they had accumulated money to send home. And they would give it to me to hold in case they didn't get back. I could send it to their wife. They trusted you. Yeah. I had to trust somebody. That's true. Did you have a lot of them do that? Did they give you letters? Or? Several of them and letters and stuff like that, yeah. That's got to be kind of heart-wrenching. That's true. Fortunately, I didn't have to do it. Okay. They were lucky. Tell me about some of your, uh, what was your rank on the ship? I was a lieutenant and I came out as a first lieutenant. A first lieutenant. At the um, end. Tell us about some of your um, other jobs. Like you said, you were a health officer on the ship. Yeah, I had to make inspection with the with the uh, assistant captain. We called him well, the captain, and then you had the next one was in. Well, they would make inspection once a week, and uh, fortunately, I'd go with them because they had a lot of ice cream down in. <laughs> In one of the holes, but we'd inspect all the all the uh, holes which had food and so forth. We didn't inspect the men's quarters. <laughs> Just the food. Just the food, and that was that was a, a good thing to do. A good thing. Now, after the armistice was signed, we had on our ship a barber shop. And we had two barbers that cut the hair all the time. And after the armistice, they got sent ashore. So we didn't have anybody to cut hair, and my corpsman got to be long hair, so I took him down to the barber shop and started cutting hair. How'd you learn how to cut hair? I just owned them. <laughs> <laughs> but they had all the instruments, and two chairs, and I spent a lot of time cutting hair. Even the officers got me to cut the hair. And I would, I would charge them a drink when we got ashore. <laughs> <laughs> and one afternoon, this was after the war, the captain's boy came down and said, the captain wants you to come up and cut his hair. And I said, well, tell the captain to come on down here and I'll cut it. <laughs> So he came down, I cut his hair, but I wasn't about to go up there and cut his hair. <laughs> and one one trip during during the war, this this he was a regular Navy captain. He had a big old boxer dog. He was crazy about his dogs. <laughs> and uh he had taken him to the veterinarian when we were ashore. I don't know what for I, I didn't ask anyway. We were out sailing in the in the Pacific, and he sent his captain down and said, the captain wants to talk to you. I said, okay. So he says, my dog here has got the sniffles bad. and said, they didn't do anything for him when we were at, at uh, shore. Do you think you could fix him up something? No. I said, well, yeah. So I went down and to the pharmacy and had him fix him up some good old cough syrup and that dog got well right quick. <laughs> but that dog would, would go 
all over the ship, just run all over it like, like Susan's dog. <laughs> <coughs> and one morning we were in port with the the uh, cargo hose. What? Cargo hose. Yeah, the hose open where you put cargo. Uh -huh. uh, and while we were saying, he jumped on top of that and goes never. Well. He uh, didn't realize we were sure. He he jumped on one, fell in the bottom, and we had to take him and X-ray him and all that oh. stuff. He was okay, right? Yeah, he was. He fortunately <laughs> was okay. Fortunately for you, you had to set the dog's leg. So you had a pharmacist on ship too. Huh? Did you have a pharmacist on the ship? Yeah, you we had a, a had a little drugstore. Yeah. But did you have a pharmacist on board? I don't think so. Okay, so you were kind of a pharmacist too. No, I wasn't a pharmacist, but the they had somebody that, a uh, corpsman did Corman. all that kind of work, yeah. Okay. Um, now, this says here, um, tell us about some of your most mis memorable experiences. You've talked about Iwo Jima and... Uh, I've told you about it. That's it? Just two? Yeah. Have any more? Okay. Okay, what else? Now this is during the war. Okay. Then we have. Uh, okay. well, listen, wait a minute. Wait a minute. After we're the war, were you still? Okay. okay, was this still on ship? Okay, let's go back. Still on ship after the war was over. You were still on the ship. Well, after the armistice was signed, we were in uh, uh, Japan, and we got orders to vaccinate everybody because we were going to China. Vaccinate for what? This was after the after the armistice. Yeah. To take troops or pick up troops, I forgot which. Anyway, we started vaccinating everybody and the, the captain had already got always gotten out of it, but we got him. <laughs> and his arm was the worst one. He had the most he had the worst reaction. Oh, really? What were you vaccinating for? Smallpox. Smallpox. Yeah. Okay. But boy, his okay. arm got really bad. But anyway, then and said, yeah. after the war, I was supposed to be the recreation officer because we we lost a lot of people and lost a lot of officers because they cut it down to a minimum. And I remember one Christmas we were in Portland, Oregon, and uh, they said, "Here's a thousand dollars." buy some equipment for these boys exercise or so forth so I called this fella and asked him if he'd meet me this was Christmas Eve and everything was closed <laughs> and he met me down at that their store and I could not spend a thousand dollars for what I wanted I bought boxing gloves <laughs> volleyballs everything you could use in a hole and we had tournaments and everything we could think of, but I couldn't spend a thousand dollars for what I needed. Amazing. Yeah, but but that was quite a trip after the service. Tell us about the appendicitis. Well, we were at uh, I guess uh, Hol uh, Honolulu. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. And our ship was empty. We had gotten come in from Japan, and at that time, MacArthur said nobody will leave with an empty ship. But we left with the empty <laughs> ship, and we sailed back to Pearl Harbor. And nobody on shore except us. Food for a whole crowd. We ate like kings, <laughs> and that's when I gained a lot of weight too. But we used to have a lot of exercises and so forth and so forth. <laughs> and we got to Pearl Harbor and tied up against a ship exactly like ours. Why? I don't know. Anyway, they s told us we would take their crowd to America. So all of their boys came aboard our ship, and then we set sail. And we hadn't we hadn't been 
away from the port an hour or so. This poor boy come ragging down the soap with his finger in his side. And we had some we had some some troops we were taking back, Navy troops. But uh, I was the only doctor aboard and there was one doctor well as a passenger. Anyway, I figured he had the appendicitis and I talked to the captain. I said, this boy's got bad appendix and we got to operate. He says, okay, when you get set up, call me and you'll be in charge of the ship. That meant I could keep it slow uh -huh. so it wouldn't be so rough. So we took that boy's appendix out. <laughs> the corpsman that I had says, Let's don't tell them we're through. <laughs> we're in charge. <laughs> but anyway, well, that's funny. that was, that was, a, but he got well. That's what that's counts. That's a good thing. Did you have any other surgeries you had to do at sea? No, that's no. all. What was the most um, common medical problem you saw during the weeks or days? Just sick cold, colds. No seasickness? Very little, because these boys were, had been through all that. A lot of them would, the first time out of port, they'd get sick, and after that, most of them got well. Okay. We had one regular Navy man. He was in charge of the the uh, mechanics, the engine and all that. He'd been in the Navy, Lord knows when. <laughs> he drank 10 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> but he always got sick the first day. And after that, it was fun. One day. I don't know how they do it, but that's what happened. And uh, we uh, remember one one time we were in port at some island in the Pacific, I've forgotten which. And uh, on a ship next to ours was Billy King. Remember Billy? Yeah. Surgeon at Griffin. I knew him when they lived in. He was all there on that ship, so we had a nice conversation. And most of the colored boys were mess sergeants. Mm -hmm. They waited on and down on the, back then, and that's what they did in the Navy. They don't do that anymore, you know. And he says, how in the world do you keep these folks on the toe? I said, well, you have to think about yourself and just make some orders. That's all. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of stupid of him asking me how to take yeah. care of a colored boy. <laughs> Your ships were segregated, though, right? Huh? Your ships were segregated. No. They, oh, right. everybody the slept together. Were, they yeah. slept with white men? Oh, yeah. No. Sailors. Really? Yeah. So the black crew didn't sleep with black crew and white No, I, didn't know I don't that. think so. I don't, they didn't have any special places. Just asked. Now, after another thing, after the war, we were in Japan. One of, our ship was one of the first ones that ended, went into Japan after the, after the uh, armistice. Bomb. After the bomb, yeah, not after the armistice, but after the bomb. And uh, I took my corpsman. We 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 pulled in at a uh, dock where they made ships, Japanese made ships and all. And I, we pulled in, and I took my corpsman aboard and let them spend the night on Japanese soil. <laughs> the Japanese that we could talk to, they would talk about the B twenty sevens. They never mentioned the bomb at all. And where we were, we could look way over there and see where the bomb hit, and it looked like nothing but a, just a flat, wide open space. That's all. And between us and that, there was a hospital ship. They wouldn't let us get that close. Really? But it's amazing what that thing did. It's, it's, you wouldn't believe it. Nothing, just flat space. Did you Nagasaki? No, this was the bomb. I don't remember Hiroshima? which one it was. Hiroshima? 
And I think it was the last one. Yeah. Did you see any of the victims of the radiation? I did not. I did not see. We didn't. They wouldn't let us go ashore much. I see. But the funniest thing that happened several weeks after the thing, our ship was supposed to pick up some Americans, British, and so forth, who had lived in Japan all their life. Mm -hmm. And some officer had convinced them they'd have to leave. Why, I don't know. They didn't want to leave. But anyway, there were two British fellows I remember in that, and they told them they would take them out in a luxury ship and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> well, when we got ready to pick them up, they were going on a fighting ship. <laughs> And these two British come dragging on the ship with the golf clubs and say, where's the ball? Where's the ball? <laughs> so we took, we took them to uh, another island out of Japan and let them off there. <laughs> they could play golf. <laughs> well, they figured this is a luxury ship. They promised sure. them, but they didn't. But it, anyway, it messed them up. Um, were you awarded any medals or citations? If I, I don't think so. Don't think so. Battle stars. Battle stars. Anything for. Well, the the, the, the battle things, yeah. Okay. Not like Purple Heart or anything. <laughs> no. That's the speaking of speaking of Purple Purple Heart, this officer. He is always loud mouth and all that. We were at general quarters. This might have been at Okinawa, I've forgotten which. Anyway, a shell hit the front of the ship and glanced off and hit him in the fanny. And he was down in front. He wasn't on his duty, his post, in the first place. But we had to take it out, and I said, well, I don't know why we ought to take it. Let's leave it in there. <laughs> out of position, get hit in the fanny, and damn if he didn't get a Purple Heart for that. He got a Purple Heart for getting a shell in his fanny. Yeah, out of position. And you had to take it out. Yeah, we had to. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Okay. All right. This section is called Life. How did you stay in touch with your family? By letter. V-mail. Just letter. V-mail? Mail, not email. Yeah, that's what it's v. called. V like Victor. Regular mail. Yeah, snail mail. What was the food like? Food in the Navy was real good. Real good. You had good cooks? <laughs> when, when we had visitors, army boys going with us, yeah. they couldn't believe that we had hot <laughs> breakfast every day. <laughs> When they were eating powdered eggs and stuff like that. I said, yeah, well, you, did you have plenty of supplies? Oh, we had plenty of supplies. Did you feel pressure or stress? You never felt stress when you were sitting out there without the convoy? with. No. What's going to be is going to be. I know, but it's got to be scary. Um, was there something special you did for good luck? No, I don't remember. Lo racket, lucky rabbit's foot or no, nothing lucky like that. Or, no, right. no. Now you've alluded to this already, but how did the people on your ship entertain themselves? <laughs> well, they were so busy most of the times. You didn't. Well, unless you were sailing between some place to the next, you really didn't have much to do. Really. And uh, when you put six people in one little bunk. <laughs> When four of them can get up at once, ain't much entertainment you can do. I mean, did they read, play cards? Um... Well, they had a ward room, but nobody stayed <laughs> in it much. Did you? Did, could you see movies on the ship? Did they have a place where you could see movies? I don't ever remember seeing a movie. No? Okay, time out? Time out. Okay, Miss Lily. Wait a minute, back up. These, Those are what? These were the letters. She saved, Not um, probably not all, but most of the letters that he had written during his time in the Navy. And in it, you do mention seeing some movies on, on board. 
ship. So you did have a little bit oh. of Must have been to some other ship. But <laughs> did you have USO entertainers? Well, one thing that I did aboard the ship, and, and, and this was at the request of the patients, when we weren't busy, I circumcised one boy every week. <laughs> But they, they How requested much? it. How much? How much you charge? <laughs> you didn't charge for that. <laughs> and how old were these people that you were operating on? Well, they were young men that who who begged me to do it. Why did they do that? They wanted it done. Why? I didn't ask them. I'm just curious. I, I don't know. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> now, we, we had a dentist aboard who who, when we were in port, he was busy. Really? Because they would come from every ship they found that didn't have them, and he, he was very busy, yeah. But when we were sailing, they he didn't do very much. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. We have a picture over here, um, if you can zoom in on it. And I think this is the official Navy photograph. <laughs> yeah. Of Lieutenant J.G., later Lieutenant. Lieutenant J.G. Yes. Metters. Mm -hmm. yes, and just a few That's years all. later, yeah, the real thing. <laughs> okay, uh, what did you do when you were on leave? You well, when we were on leave, most of the time, we had to be back aboard ship at 6 o'clock. P.M.? P.M. And we would leave at 3, oh. so we would go <laughs> drink beer and come back. For three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have to round up people who didn't quite make it back by 6 o'clock? Well, some of them would, because the, uh, <laughs> the Navy Army boys, what do you call them? MPs. The, 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 the Army. Yeah, MPs. I mean, the MPs would bring them back to the ship. <laughs> I remember one day. One time we were tied up right next to the dock, which is unusual. And they started bringing them back, <laughs> and they'd put them in these baskets and lift them aboard. Oh, no. They'd put them in the sack. And the captain said, boy, I'm telling you, if they have a good time, I know they're going to be a good soldier, <laughs> sailors. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> Did you get the films and the lectures on syphilis and all the bad things that can happen when you're on shore? Y'all didn't do that, okay? They didn't worry about that. Didn't worry about that. Um, See, we didn't even have any indoctrination. Well, you were a doctor. To speak of. I hope you'd know that. Do you recall any particular um, humorous events or pranks that you pulled on people or that other people did? No. What? what? The, the, uh, the what? The Neptune. Oh, the Neptune. Hey, Neptune. Oh, well, that was um, when you first went aboard the ship. If you crossed the equator, mm -hmm. they always had this big program where you would be indoctrinated into King Neptune's order. Okay. And what they did was that particular morning, the ship was turned over to King Neptune, <laughs> who was one of the boys that had been done that center. Uh -huh. And he was in charge of the whole ship. And all of the Navy personnel had to do that. So what they did, they had several different areas. The first area, they'd cut your hair this way and this way. Oh, and then you had to shave it because you couldn't wear it like that. <laughs> that was the first thing they did. And then they made you go through this line and eat this horrible stuff. <laughs> you didn't know what it was, but you had to eat it. And uh, a few more things. At the end, you had to run about as far as from here to, out to the car down the lane, and on each side were sailors. And if you didn't run fast, they'd hit you with those wet towels. I mean, oh, wet things. 
<laughs> the faster you run, the less it was. And when you got to the end, you jumped in the big thing of salt water. Oh. <laughs> and uh, we had troops aboard. And they were asked if they wanted to, they could be uh, they could indoctrinated if they wanted to. And a lot of them did. And I remember this poor one officer, he he uh, got hit pretty hard. And he stopped. And when he stopped, God, they beat the fire out of him. <laughs> Finally, he got up and ran. I had to put him in sick bay. Really? I said, well, you fool, you ought not to stop. I said, you're the only one in your crowd that did that. I said, <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't like it. So we had to, his, his testicles was about that big. He got hit on it. <laughs> no. In other words, they were aiming for certain parts of the body, not your shoulders necessarily. Well, they'd aim, you, see, you were running, boy. They'd, Did you have clothes on? The, yeah. Okay. Nice yeah. Bathing suit? <laughs> Bathing suit? Anyway. That's kind of strange. That's yeah. And you get a, what a, uh, do you dress up? Do you get a certificate? Yeah, the, I've got a little certificate home. says I'm an order of <laughs> King Neptune's things, yeah. What did the king look like? Did he come all dressed up? The that was in yeah, trouble. he was Had put on like yeah. <laughs> and they they had our, our our we have a had a preacher, uh, our pastor or what do you call it, chaplain, our chaplain. They had him up on one of the Higgins boat ships at the one at the top, and made him read this sexist story. Oh no. <laughs> That's funny <laughs> to everybody. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Cause he didn't he didn't like to show movies aboard ship. He didn't. That's the reason we didn't have many movies. But after he read that thing, he kind of lim lim limbered <laughs> up a little bit. Well, okay. Okay. How how many years were you on a ship? I mean. A little over two years, two, years. two and a half years, continual? I guess. Just yeah, continue. Well, I, leave? I went out on one ship and switched over to another one, which was the same type. Okay. You remember the names of the ships? Yeah, the first one was the Fond du Lac, Fond du Lac. named after Fond du Lac, Michigan. Okay. And the next, the the this the second one was the Aldrain. And it was an older ship than the Fond du Lac, and it had a little bit more room on it. It was a lot more, lot more, <laughs> lot less rigorous than the first one. <laughs> now, your captain that had the dog was he the first one, first ship or the second ship? He was the second ship. Second ship. The okay. older ship, yeah. Okay. And you've been to some reunions, haven't you? I went to your baby and I went to one reunion in Texas. Okay, Oklahoma. Yeah, I don't think I went to any others, did I? I don't think, I don't so. think so. Okay, how old were you when you uh, enlisted? Close, approximate. You weren't a spring chicken when you enlisted, were you? No, I wasn't a young one like the rest of them. Okay, about 32, 33. Well, we got married in thirty-seven. <laughs> I mean, 47. We got married in 49. 49, yeah. so. Go back. That was you? about, well, I was th about when I was 30 plus. 30 plus, but you had already gone to medical school. Oh, yeah. Unlike a lot of the people. And I had worked, had three years residency. Okay. And how old will you be in September? I mean, August. This year? Uh huh. 91. 91. Excellent. All right, did you keep a personal diary? I had one, but it wasn't every day. Okay. Uh, but you did keep a diary? Yeah. I kept one thing, but I left it aboard ship. Aww. I had a whole uh, map of the, ocean, of the Pacific Ocean, and I had every date and how long it was to the next stop and the date and how many miles. And when I left, I left in such a hurry, I left. <laughs> You're glad to get off. 
When were you um, dismissed? When did you where? discharged? When and where? Do you remember about what year and where? I forgot, but it, it, I was I was no, at no, 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 Corpus Christi. I mean, uh, not Corpus Christi, but uh, what's the name? Paris Island. Paris Island? Yeah. When I got off ship, I went to Paris Island. For how long? Three months. Just three months? Three or four months, yeah. Not too long, because I needed that much more time to say, finish. I was why did they send you to a Marine base? Well, the Navy took care of Marines. I know, why did they send you there? Well, where else? I don't know. I'm just asking. Just, you needed uh, more training, medical training? No, I was pilling time. Well, you had three more months. Yeah. Oh, I got you. I got you. Okay. That was 47. 47. Okay. Uh, after the service, um, and this is just if you want to answer these, do you recall the day that your service ended? Very much. We were, <laughs> we were at sea. And the armist when the war ended, yeah. Uh -huh. What were you doing, and how did you find out that the war was over? Well, you know, they always had the communication between ships. Did they call everybody up on deck? and? No, they just announced it. Really? Over the intercom. And what did people do? Hoop and holler? And <laughs> Yelled and hollered, carried on, yeah. naturally. Had to be a weird feeling, though. To yeah. Still be it. <laughs> and I remember when I was, we were at sea when Roosevelt died, too. Really? And that was April? I forgot. 40. 45? Uh, yeah. April something? No, wait a minute. No, it was in April. It was in, it was in April. What were you doing? 43, if I remember. Remember? You just. 43, I think. 43? I think. Or maybe 44. You just remember that day in your in your yeah. brain. Probably forty-five. Okay. After the service, what did you do after you were after you finished your service and returned? Did you go back to Tacoa? Yeah, I went back to Tacoa, but also went back to Grady. We need to mention here that Dr. Meadows was uh, born in North Georgia and grew up in Toccoa, Georgia. We didn't mention that. So you went back to Toccoa to home, but then you went back to Atlanta to Grady? Yeah, to finish my three months. Okay, the next question was, did you go back to work or school? But you went back to Grady to finish your residency? Right. Um, was any of your education supported by the GI Bill? No. Because okay. you'd already pretty much done it. Yes. Yeah. Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Quite a few. Do you continue? Did you continue any of those relationships? Not today. They I all did. Yeah. Hank. Hank. What about Hank Hankins? Yeah. Can you take a minute and tell us about Hank Hankins, Dr. Hankins? Well, okay. let's see. I remember <laughs> while I was at Paris Island. Two or three new doctors came in, and one of them was Dr. J. Uh, J. J. Was Banks, Hank. Hank Hankins from North Carolina. Uh, what was the boy from Oklahoma City? Cook. Cook, Cook and Rip. the piano player. Rip. 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 Those boys came down, and we got to be good close. Uh, we used to go to the club and listen to Rip play at night. Now, were, all they, were they all single like you? Hank was married. Hank was married. But the other two were single. Okay. Young doctors on the loose. What it was, if I could interject yeah, here. Sure. Um, yeah, sure. As, as Speed mentioned earlier, during, during World War II, the, uh, the B-12 program, uh, they... They, the people in college and in, in professional schools were put on a 12-month round-the-clock round -the basis. And the, so they got all the education free. And they were assigned, of course, I mean, 
they, when they finished, if they if the war was still going on, they went into the service. But after the war, they still quote quote had to I serve. Used, they used the term they owed that that mm-hmm. many years to the various um, services. So these men were down there. The war was over, but they 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 had finished their training after 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 the the armistice. So they they were down there. Uh, fulfilling their finishing out, yeah, finishing their obligation. Their well, now obligation. on um, Paris Island, were you Island. practicing obstetrics and gynecology? Or were you just practicing? Well, I was in the family planning unit. The family planning unit. That's the the family unit. The family unit. Yeah, because <laughs> I <laughs> I delivered babies. Okay. Had a few. I guess that's what I was doing. <laughs> I guess. I forgot. Okay. Um, did you join a veterans organization after the war? No. Okay. Um, segment six. What did you go on to do as what did you go on to do as a career after the war? Your career. M- medicine. Right. And? And that's it. You stayed in OBGYN, right? Yeah. All those years. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Oh, yeah. What did you think before the war and what did you think after the war? Did you have perceptions before the war since you enlisted? Well, the thing about it, I didn't know anything about the war before. I had no idea what it was like. And after being in it, it's about the reverse of what you think of. Really? Well, how would I know? Mm-hmm. I've never been in a war. But you have to So all you do is read about it. Mm-hmm. But until you're there, it's a different story. Um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? That's a really big question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer okay. that. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add that has not been covered in this inter- interview? I don't think so. Oh, come on. Anything? What did your um was all right, let's let's go out just a little bit. In your immediate family, right? Pretty much everybody was involved in the service somehow, were they not either married to somebody in the service or was in the service? Yep. Was there anybody in your family that wasn't married to or involved with somebody in the service? Pretty much everybody, weren't they? Everybody was. Everybody was. Yeah. Except Steve Fuller. He's too old. He's too old, right? Yeah. That's the only one. And you had one brother. And what branch of the service was he in? He was in the Army. Army. And what did he do? He, uh, he was in China. And he flew over the hump in the army. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what he did. Well, do you remember what his his job was? What his what he was in charge of? Didn't have something to do with weather? What did I get that? No, I, I, I don't remember, remember Charles did or not. Exactly what Charles. Did. You uh, also lived near the famous Curahee Mountain training facility. Right. I never did know much about it though. Didn't know much about it. Well, Robert yeah, well, he was over there, he but was, I wasn't around much. That was army done. Okay. All right. Well, um, so there's nothing you'd like to add to this? No, I think we've done it. I think we've done it too, and we want to thank you very much, Dr. Matters, and appreciate everything you've had to share. If you think of anything, let us know. Videotape is okay. Cheap. But we very much appreciate it. I remember one thing. Never mind. As I, as I, went from Corpus Christi to San Diego, to go aboard ship. I had bought. My dad had helped me buy a Mercury convertible. What year? I forgot. Anyway, anyway, I drove it to Corpus Christi. And when I drove it to. California, I drove it up in this 
car place, and the fella says, I'll give you $1,200 for it. I paid 500 And uh, he says, you going to sell it? I said, yeah, I'm going to sell it on one condition. You got to take me out to the to my ship at the ocean, at the edge of the ocean out here. He said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and he says, now, had you rather have the cash or you want to get credit for a new car when you get back? I said, I may not get back. <laughs> so I took the cash and sent it home. <laughs> Good for you. You made a quick 600 And then he took me to my ship, and I got out of that car and crawled and went aboard. How long did it take you to drive from Georgia to California? Well, to see, California? I went stopped at Corpus Christi and spent six or eight weeks, and then to California. As well as I remember, it took three nights, and I, I carried one of the boys from Grady, his wife, with me. She was going out there. <laughs> and the worst thing we had was finding two rooms together. <laughs> really. Goodbye. Well, that's true, because... Yeah. Uh, was that where you uh, had the flat tire? Yeah, oh, yeah. No. We, you and this married woman's wife. I mean, married yeah, that's wife. right. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to some little town in Texas, and I had I had already used up all my tires except one that wasn't very good to start with. <laughs> and it went down on me in this little town one Sunday. <laughs> and I stopped this filling station and... He said, well, I, I, I can't sell you a tire. I said, I'll tell you what you do. Go out here and see Mr. So-and-so. He told me where he lived out on the edge of town. And he let me have a car to go out there to talk to him. And I was in my uniform. <laughs> we went out there. I went out there. And the fellow said, come on in, son. Come on in, son. And I told him what I wanted. He said, well... I'll call him and tell him to sell him anything you want. Right. Says that's what we're for. He was on the draft board. <laughs> and we take care of you boys. Right. So I went on back and bought me a new tire. Mm -hmm. You got that uniform? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was you, great. Well, see, gasoline was rationed then, too. If you didn't have on a uniform and didn't have orders, you couldn't buy gasoline. Thank goodness. You did. So I was glad to get rid of that car. <laughs> that woman in that car. <laughs> that woman in that car. Can we have one more shot of the picture? We'll close it out with that. <laughs> this is excellent. Oops. Hold it up. I know. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hold still. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, we are now interviewing uh, B.B. Moore Metters, Dr. Metters' wife. Um, who was a civilian during World War II, and she has some specific memories we'd like to get um, during the war as a civilian. Um, what was your maiden name? Moore. <laughs> Baby Moore. Moore. Uh -huh. What is your age? I am 81. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Waycross, Georgia, but moved to Marietta, uh, Georgia, at the age of two, and have often I've been there the rest of my life. Um, what is your family background, educational background? Well, my family, the, the, uh, honey, you can't talk. <laughs> Tell him not to talk. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my family were pioneer uh, citizens in Cobb County and in Marietta. And um, as, as I say, well, my father had moved to Waycross, Georgia, and then uh, came back to Marietta to assist his father in, who was in peach culture, raising peaches. And so uh, that's why we, we moved back there, and, and as I say, I've always been there. I uh, 
finished two years of college and have had some, some additional work since then. At the time of World War II, were you in a relationship, married or single? I was single. You were single. I was 19 years old. How many? 19. 19 years old. Um, where did you live or work during the war? Well, when the war uh, started, I was living in Marietta and working in Atlanta. I had just begun a job uh, at the CNS National Bank in Atlanta, which I really didn't like, but it was a job. <laughs> <laughs> and I was living in Marietta with my family and commuting. Okay, and so what was your main wartime activity? You said re ARC service. American well, uh, after about a year of, of commuting, which turned it into be a real pain, I got a job working at Emory University and as uh, secretary to the dean of the undergraduate school, and was able to to uh, live out there, to board out there. And what, uh, now I can't remember okay. what was first. <laughs> well, it just says, uh, what type of training, what activity did you do, what was your title? Well, uh, as I say, at that point, uh, well, that was in 1942, I think. 42, okay. Uh-huh. And um, I, as I say, I was secretary to, uh, to the dean uh, at the undergraduate school. And actually, as the more and more men were drafted, more and more students were drafted, uh, you, you just worked for everybody, anybody who needed you. You you were their secretary at the time. Okay. Did you uh, have family and friends in the service? Both my the both my brothers. One was in the army and one was in the navy, okay. and many friends. Uh, my class in high school, nineteen thirty nine, actually, they were one of the that was one of the hardest hit classes. I mean, by that, the number of of uh, people. Uh, men who, who uh, went into the army, they were among the first. Did both your brothers return? Yes, mercifully they did. They did. And were not wounded, so we were very blessed. During wartime, um, how did you feel about the war? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, such a, it's such a surreal feeling almost when you think back on it now because when Pearl Harbor was bombed, well... Go back to what happened. Where were you? What were you doing with Pearl Harbor? It was Sunday afternoon, yes, my family, uh, as was our custom, grass, uh, gathered at, at our home, and mother cooked big Sunday dinner, and we were sitting around after after dinner, uh, having, we were reading the paper, and just, just sitting there, and had the radio on, and the news came over that Pearl Harbor, well, I frankly didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, but uh, soon found out, and the, both the boys immediately said, "Well, they were neither neither of them was married at the time, and they said, "Well, of course they would felt like they would be very high on the draft in the draft situation, which they were." But um, we just thought our country's been attacked. Did and you have a clue? Uh, no. Was it total surprise? You didn't. Oh, absolutely, any of war absolutely. Or were... Well, thinking back when I was a student in college. I remember now uh, hearing professors talk about uh, uh -huh. the the coming crisis in Europe, yeah. and of course Czechoslovakia when he was invaded. You and were aware of Hitler, though. Oh yes, oh, very aware of Hitler. But, but Hitler not Japan. was no Japan was it was just absolutely nothing bad. But uh, there was there was just a feeling of total hey we've been we've been attacked so we fight. I mean there was never any question. Yeah. No, no discussion, no dissension that I was aware of. Um, did you live with family, friends, or coworkers? Only, only for about oh, not quite a, a year because I say I, uh, it, it was necessary to commute, and and that was it was just the the uh, gasoline was rationed, couldn't get tires. I I didn't have a car, so uh, that was not a problem for me. But to find somebody else who had a car and could get gasoline, that that was well, something else. This goes into the next question. Mm -hmm. It said, in what ways did the war change your activities or habits? What were some of the first changes in your life after the war started? So talk a little bit about rationing and well, shortages or... Well, rationing, uh, I was trying, as I looked over those questions, I was really trying to think. Rationing, I don't think, impacted me because, I say, I had no car. The, the gasoline was the big thing. The, because when gasoline was rationed, unless you had a, a particular sticker, you had an A sticker and a B sticker that designated your, uh, how much you were allowed to buy. 
if you had a job in defense or if you were in the military or something something like that, then you, you could your quota was high. But I didn't. And so gasoline ration probably affected me more. Sugar was rationed. Sugar. Uh huh. And uh butter. Hose. Oh, that. hose. That was the worst. <laughs> that was the absolute worst. <laughs> of course, nylon hadn't come on the scene by then, but we silk, and that was one thing when the job that I first had, you, you uh, hose, and you, you dressed with hose and heels, mm -hmm. and so it was good that I... Did you I, turn in your hose, or did you just not buy any more? Did you want any for sale? Uh, well, you could get them from time to time. Every once in a while, they'd, some would come on the market, but the the job that I took at Emory, we were allowed to dress far more casually, so right. the hose problem was not quite as well, much as it had been. What about rubber? I know we said rubber was. Or metal. Well, that was the tires mostly, okay. and uh, uh, meat was rationed, but we lived on a farm, and that had never been a you know a consideration. Shoes were rationed. Shoes. Uh huh. Uh, Even boots and. Well, I don't know I about guess boots. But what do you mean ration? Could you only buy one you pair could, a year? You, yeah, you had uh, tickets. You had a ration book, and uh, you'd have so many tickets or so many pages in the book. And when you bought a pair of shoes, you took the ticket out and gave it to them, and you didn't have any more tickets when, the, when all the tickets were gone. Then you, like the black market. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think own. hose probably. Hose. If, if, <laughs> if there was a black market, hose probably would have been it. Um, let's see. How did you entertain yourself out of outside of work during the war years? That's kind of a bizarre question, but well, did, I mean, you could still go to the movie. You could still oh yeah, go. actually, uh, here again and thinking back, it was I, th I think, and, and and I use the term as a single woman. Uh, in other words, if you did not have an escort, you still you could you could move much more freely. There was never any question of anybody being molested or, or bothered in any way. You you could ride, a, I would many times, if I wanted to see a concert or something or a movie or downtown, if I didn't have a date, I'd just get on the streetcar and ride down there and come back and walk back to the, where I was, was living. And it, there was, I never had any feeling of being afraid or anything like that. And that, that was such a, a good thing. Considering that men Considering, were you, if, you know, if you, you stayed home all the time, if you didn't uh, have, a, have a feeling of that security. Um, how did you feel about war news? How did you get your news? Did you go to newsreels at the movie? Did you listen to the radio? Well, that's all it was. <laughs> that was it. Newspaper, radio, did and newsreels. Like one-sided, just fed to you a certain way? Or? No. Okay. No, never. Very comfortable with. Them. Very comfortable. Um, let's see. They talked about rationing grease here. Well, maybe <laughs> so. I don't know if that affected rubber me. Grease, a recycling rubber grease or other commodities. Interesting. To what extent was there hoarding or black market activity in your area? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember any. I was not in a situation probably where that would have occurred. I mean, by that, I didn't live in a situation where, where I would have Did known have about it. Did you have a victory garden? Or other well, not where I lived. My father, as I say, uh, we lived on a farm, so uh, it, was, uh, it was in full production, I mean. How did your community respond to the war and civil defense or other home front initiatives? I don't remember any situation like that. I, I really don't because... Uh, I was living in two places, you might say. I I would board for during the week near my job, and then I would come home on the weekends. I don't remember. I think we were probably a little too far removed from any field that we would have any actual uh, combat to be concerned. Okay. Um, did you ever worry that our side might not win? I think during the during the. Uh, first part of the war in the Pacific when the tide was turned so badly against us. I mean by that when we were being just defeated in one battle after another before the, uh, the well the, the sheer numbers and the before, before we were able to 
to mount an offensive, really, uh -huh. because well, Guadalcanal like and yeah, Guadalcanal, and um, and then of course during the Battle of the Bulls, that was a very scary time too. So, uh, okay. Um, do you have? Um, Memories or what was your most memorable experience during the war? Memorable character, humorous experience. Well, actually, after in in, I guess it was 1943, 40, 40, 43, 44. A good friend of mine had joined the Red Cross, and I thought, well, that that would be sort of nice to do, and would would be an interesting situation. But I wasn't quite old enough, so by the time I got old enough, and and uh, was accepted into the Red Cross training program. The war was just about over, but I went ahead and went through the training to be a member of the of Red Cross and was assigned as a hospital staff aide. My experience with hospitals had been to have my appendix taken out and my tonsils removed, and that, that was about all I knew about hospitals at that time. <laughs> But uh, so I had no idea what was going on. But they, the Red Cross gave. Uh, I took about six weeks of very extensive training uh, about what I would be doing. It would be on the social work end of the. No, I would not be involved in the in the actual medical part, but on the social work end. So I went. Uh, I was assigned to uh, the Overseas Replacement Depot, Air Force hospital in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I got to my first, uh, the, the first day of the, two weeks after I got there, the uh, VJ day was declared, so the war, <laughs> war was over, and I thought, well, that was a short career, <laughs> but being an overseas replacement depot, that meant that the men were coming back from the various fronts and being discharged are being taken care of there at the hospital and then being discharged and then those going over to replace them uh, in in their positions. So it was a coming and going thing. And I had many interesting experiences there. Is that where you want me to I don't know. I'm go from there? You <laughs> Said, you know, uh, well, uh, memorable experiences. Of I, I would think that those were the most memorable experiences and even though they weren't during the war itself, it was a situation rather interesting. It was almost a frozen in time thing. The men were home, but they couldn't go home. Kind of like you said. They were at in a hospital, and very few of them were critically ill. Most of them were uh, orthopedic situations mm -hmm. or some minor thing that would keep them from being discharged. And while they couldn't go home, their parents or their family often couldn't come to see them because transportation was just a zoo at the time. I mean, to think about riding a train or a bus somewhere, was it was <laughs> they were just packed with servicemen going going back home. So and and gasoline and rubber was still rationed, so you couldn't do much. And so here were these men in the hospital, really not very sick, <laughs> who were. Um, unhappy, shall we say, bored. So it was up to us to uh, do whatever we could. And which one, is. Which is, well, we had guidelines, of course, and parameters, and we we were not the recreational end of, of the Red Cross. Yeah, but you were social. Yeah. But uh, the uh, yeah. two things I remember, one day we were just at our wits end. We had written letters, we had read, we had played games, we'd done everything we could think of, and so we had a little staff meeting, and we decided, well, hey, we'll just go tell fortunes. So we got no. some cards, and we went out, and we first one, we cut the card, oh, you're going home, and you're going to, oh, absolutely, <laughs> you're going to marry the girl of your dreams, and you're going to be very successful, and all, and all, and all, and all. So I got to this fella, and he was, his complexion was rather swarthy, and I started my little speech, and he said, Hand me those cards, lady. He said, I'm the seventh son of the seventh son of a gypsy, so sit down and I'll tell you a fortune. <laughs> so we got back to the, the uh, office and our supervisor had heard about our little experience. She decided that was not the best thing <laughs> we'd ever done. So our fortune telling was very short lived, but I got my fortune told. I you did. Was he right? I don't even remember. <laughs> but the other thing we got came Christmas time. And here the, the war was over in August, 
months. So that was September, October, November. There were four months. After the war was over, the men were there. They couldn't go home. The people couldn't come, and it was Christmas. And so um, we, uh, we just decided that we needed to make it as, as, un, as painless as possible. Yeah. So we worked it out, and we had a, got a wonderful meal. And then we, uh, we just took the rec hall, and we decorated, and we just put everything we could find. And then we got, uh, we just, the Christmas day after a good meal, we, we brought beds, we brought wheelchairs, we brought everything we could find into the, the rec hall, and we did have a USO show. Aww. Donald O'Connor was our, Donald was Donald, he was the star performer, and had a wonderful rec, uh, you know, show, USO show. And so I think, considering all things, possibly it, it made the, day as pleasant as it could have been under the circumstances. Well, I'll ask you the same thing I asked Dr. Matters. Uh, where were you when you found out that the war was over? Oh, I was sitting in the officers club at <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. at uh, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina at the Overseas Replacement Depot Hospital. Uh-huh. And everybody did? How Went did you wild. Absolutely. Drinks on the house, right? Drinks on the house, absolutely. All, everybody. And I remember I asked <laughs> silly person that I was, I, I said to this one fellow who was one of the doctors, I said, well, I wonder what the patient's going to do, because they were all saying, we're out of here, we're going home. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I said, well, what are the patients going to do? He said, they're going to have to be very patient. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Which good. expressed his feelings very <laughs> succinctly. <laughs> How did you make it over to Paris Island? You were in Greensboro, North Carolina. Well, uh, to meet as, up with this handsome <laughs> young doctor. He didn't say that, did he? I didn't ask him. Well, I, he should have. I anyway, asked him how he got to Paris. Uh huh. Okay. Well, as I say, World War II was over in August of forty-five. Forty, no, forty, forty-five. That's right. And I had been in the Red Cross uh, about a year, and they sent word down that they were closing. Uh, this was in August, I think, of 45, and they sent word they were closing the hospital. So I thought, well, that, <laughs> <laughs> that ends my career. And I knew I wasn't going to stay in the Red Cross. I mean, this was not, it was a wonderful experience, and I will treasure every, every day of it, but it was not my thing. And so, and I knew that. And so I thought, well, I'll just pack up and go home. And the supervisor called me in one day, and she said, I've just had a call from the Red Cross station down at Paris Island, South Carolina. They have a situation down there where they have a lot of what they call CDCs, which is not the CDC we know, but the Certificate of Disability Discharge. So it would be CDD. Anyway, uh, she said they need someone who has secretarial skills to help them out. It's a short term. It'll probably be two months. And I thought, well, I don't have anything else to do myself. So I got on the bus one hot August day at Greensboro, North Carolina, and rode. And if you've never been from Greensboro to Paris Island, it's one of those places you cannot get to. But I finally, they found it. Somebody from Red Cross picked me up about 10 o'clock that night down at Yamasee, South Carolina. No air conditioning. No, oh, heavens no, never yeah. heard of it. And so that was my introduction. That's how I went to Paris Island, South Carolina. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was. Uh, you dealt with people who were being discharged? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of these were well, young boys. What? This is interesting. Okay. Uh, because the war was just over, and the returning men were, were treated as heroes, as they were, and were given all sorts of just honors, and as they should have been. And a lot of times the younger brothers were thinking, hey, you know, I might like to get in all this. So none of them had lied about the age to get in the, the, Navy, the, the Marines. You know, they, they were the big boys. And they got down to Paris Island and found out it was not exactly heaven on earth. It was very close to the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> and so they were trying, they had to have a reason to, 
to get out. Oh, so they had already enlisted. They had enlisted and had oh. been had just begun. And this is most of them. Some of them were older men who had 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 uh, personal situations that they wanted to get out. But this one poor little boy came in, and I was interviewing him to take the information. And I said, he just looked pathetic. He was from some coal mining country up in West Virginia, somewhere. Saddest looking little thing you ever saw. <laughs> had lied about his age, and I said, "Well, now you know I have to have a reason why you are trying, why you feel that you need to get out." And he says, "Well, it's my mama." And I said, "Well, what's the matter with your mama?" And he said, "Well, she's 38 year old, and she's done broke down." <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote it down. <laughs> I think he got out. I'm not real sure. I don't think he was he was, he was he headed for a career in the Marine Corps. <laughs> but uh, there were there were many other situations and, and uh, that's what I did for about two months. Okay. And you hung out at the officers club. So <laughs> there was uh, listen, if you could have seen Paris at the time, it was a small thing. I mean we lived in a little house right here and here was the hospital. And attached to that was the mess hall, which was also the officer's club. <laughs> you ate at the officer's club. I mean, it was no big deal to go to the officer's club. If you wanted to eat, that's where you went. And there was this group of, of young fellas and one or two. They had, they had a number of, of uh, career Army, uh, Navy men and some, like Speed, who were finishing out their uh, time the duty. And Pretty so, good pickings for a single girl. real good. <laughs> <laughs> and they, it was it was so small, and so it was just such a, a pleasant group. I mean, by that you it was an inclusive thing. You, there was nobody that uh, pulled rank or anything like that. Somebody well, one of one of the good good friends was the captain in the navy, which is pretty high in the navy, and uh, the others were just like Lieutenant JGs who had just come in. And but it, as I say, it was a very Friendly, inclusive. That that was my feeling. And they, the nurses and the Red Cross girls, they, they, you were just all right there. Everybody was just real happy. And uh, I met this young, he was young, young fella, and um, we, he, we were both from Georgia, and so we had some little pleasantries. And he never did ask me for a date, but we double dated. And <laughs> with the hanging. No, 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 no. Hank, uh, Nola wasn't there. She was, he, he didn't have quarters at the time, and so she was still in North Carolina. But with, with, we double dated uh, with, with some of the other folks the down there. Community. What? In the small intimate community. In the small community. intimate community. And um, so that's how I met him, which it didn't lead to any, it was no great, oh, that's the one I'm going <laughs> That wasn't it at all. It took a couple of years, but, you know, things happen. Um, as we were talking, as I was talking to him and I was talking to you, speak a little bit about sort of the social climate, because we're talking mid-40s. Hmm. Um, and I'm just, politically or socially, was Paris Island um, segregated? Did you have blacks on Paris Island? In well, the you know. You think about it, you don't really think I about it. I have no clue to was answer Red Cross that. integrated in second? Did you have... Um, I, I, I did not. Now, our quarters, uh, there, there was no only mean the only. Well, now, there were about six. We were the only about six members uh -huh. in our group. It was it was small, and that we were all Caucasian, white, whatever you want to call it. And um, the hospital, I don't, I don't think was. Segregated. I do not remember. Yeah, I cannot yeah. remember. I, I did very little well, hospital Curry. ward work. Oh okay. no. Uh, well, I don't remember much in in North Carolina. Hmm. Well, th I don't think there was a large uh, group of of uh, black people in the services. I mean, compared to well, to what it is now. The yeah, they did. Uh huh. Now, I, I, I'm sure they were there. I, I wish that I had a better recall on that, but I can't answer that because I, I, I don't remember. Well, any. no women were obviously drafted. No. But they uh -uh. did serve. Oh, yeah. And here again, I, I was never in a situation where I, I had any contact with, like, the waves of the wax or 
though the nurses were always were there. Mm -hmm. I do not remember any blacks. I just I, don't. That's just an I, interesting question. Yeah, but now you got to remember that my situation was was very was totally after the war. Now during during the war and during combat, it, it possibly was a different situation altogether. Okay. Um, one last question, unless there's something you'd like to add. I don't know anything. Okay. Is there one thought about your wartime experience that you want to share with future generations? Living through a war, actually you've lived through several wars. Um, yeah, but too many. The biggie, um, as far as the way you look at <sighs> war and necessity of war or uh, unnecessity or um, inevitability or... Oh, I wish I were a wise you philosopher. Wise. No, at the end of each war, you just sit back and wonder, what did we accomplish? Mm -hmm. Of course, in World War Two, you look at the at the uh, horrible camps, mm -hmm. the death camps, the prison camps, and so many awful things, and you think, well, at least we got rid of the people who perpetuated that notion. And and I don't know. I, I just truly don't know. I and I'm very hesitant to say this because I am not a person who feels that one theory is the only theory. But when I, I came after after I got out of the Red Cross, I came back to work and Emory University hired me again. <laughs> and um, I worked in the office of the president. I worked for one of his assistants. He had two assistant, assistants at the time, and I was assigned to one, but I also knew the other one quite well. And the other one was, uh, his job was to, uh, he was a PR man for the university and, and one thing and another. And he had a, of course, everybody was very aware of the atomic bomb at the time, and our feeling was, you know, that that could eliminate civilization if, if we did not do something, not outlaw it, but corral it or, or contain it in some way. And he had a had a, a talk, a lecture, it was called World One World or None. And sometimes you wonder maybe if 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 it ever got to the point and how it would ever get there, I have not a clue. I'm not that wise. But some way or another I think people have just got to learn to live together in one world one world or we may not have one. And that's not necessarily my thinking, but it's a thought that has dwelled in my so-called brain for a long, long time. But, but as far as future generations, I, I don't know, because it's the 4th of July, and, and we need to always support our country and those men and women who have kept it free for so long. Did I? Very well said. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Meadows.